um, first thing is, is we gonna basically discuss how the bloodlines ties the um, indigenous uh, peoples here in the Americas misnamed uh, African American um, to the Moors and the, um, the Moors of Andalusia, Spain and uh, we're just gonna do it with a few uh, a few quick little text and um, references uh, to other little things on the congressional record and stuff like that. And um, by doing that, um, you know, because I also I just want to let you know that not only are they uh, connected to um, the uh, Moors of Andalusia, Spain, just the Moors in Morocco, and that uh, made they made their way not by slavery, but through um, actual um, you know uh, voyages under the ruling sultan class um, that uh, you know previous to even um, some of what we would call contemporary uh, history with respect to uh, the 1500s and things like that so um, but yeah you know this this first little text is uh, you know, the little children in the new world um, Jose Pimenta Bay and um, he's um, he, 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 you know, the brother really uh, uh, does a great job at conceptualizing uh, the history of the uh, Moors um, here in America, because you know, it's called the Moors History and Identity in the African American Experience. So they're letting you know already that, you know, we, we were once referred to as the Moors, just in general, and just, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great foundation for anybody seeking a do a basic study of Moorish history within the presence of the African American community. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm just going to read from one page of it where it talks about special treatment for and considerations for specified of Africans and Indians. In citing the research of historian James Bala, Paul Giddings points out that during the first years of the African presence in America or in North America, Blacks had a higher status than other servants because of the circumstances of their seizure put them under protection of international law. The first Africans worked as servants of the colonial administrators. Africans worked out their indentures and several subsequently purchased large parcels of land and their own and, and the services of their own servants. This is from Paula Giddings, When and Where I Enter. Um, that's uh, just to let you know what that book is from. He talks about the fact that Giddings doesn't expound on her references to circumstances of their African seizure um, or the protection given to the Africans under international law. However, it is clear that African blood was not initially synonymous with servant status in early British colonies. Giddings also points out that Europeans were even selling each other to American Indians. A Thomas Salvage and Henry Spillman were traded by Captain John Smith to some Indians in the interest of the Virginia Company. So, you know, again, this is just, you know, to show you further evidence that, you know, them, um, we, despite our, our indentured servitude or our servitude or um, our place as servants initially when this place started, we weren't even treated to the degree that we are treated now. You know, um, one of the other thing, uh, the uh, what, what, what is it? Um, yes, um, you have uh, a lot of different texts. part we gonna get from here is uh, again this is um, you know, Othello's Children in the New World but uh, he goes on to talk about the El, the titles of Ellen Bay. Uh, the presence of the titles of Ellen Bay among both African and American peoples is also significant as they are both used by Moorish Science Temple Muslims. The 
Onondaga of the Iroquois Nation used the title El as both a, as both a title and a family name. They say that the El clan sprung from the Seneca River. The El clan is known to be one of the principal lines for chiefs. In the work of William Bocamp, the name of a prominent Iroquois man, Sodus Bay, phonetically corresponds to the Moorish title of Bay. Although Sheikh Anthony Diop doesn't present an etymological or historical origin for the name Bay, he does mention the presence of the Bay clan in Senegal, West Africa. Diop identifies them as, good, as the Good Luck family. Diop says that Bay was one of the Kaorian dynastic clans who st systematically refused to embrace the Islamic religion. This appears somewhat peculiar given the fact that Bay would become so closely associated with an Islamic slash Muslim identity. Seneca, one of the nations of the Iroquois League, bears phonetic, phonetic synonymy with the Seneca or Azanaga people and region of Western Africa. Seneca is even referred to in Peter Mator's work Decades in the New World, which was translated into English in 1555. It indicated that Seneca was one of the regions of the Keningadome of Guinea, which is occupied by the black mortars called Ethiopians or Negroes. Brunson and Rashidi contend that the African ethnic name Seneca is Kushito Hamitic in origin. Yet Seneca also pertains to an indigenous people of the Americas. Equally relevant is that the Iroquois people are among those American Indians which Barry Fell and Leo Wainer specifically argued had North African Muslim links. In the presence of so much evidence suggesting parallels between continents of continents and peoples of America, Asia and Africa, it is logical to consider as Consider this as indicative of ancient and pre-Columbian contacts. Consequently, one might need to reconsider the etymological significance of the word Indian. The famed Joel informs us that Indy was an ancient Latin word for black people in general. The antiquity of the name Indian as Eurocentric refer reference for very dark complexioned peoples it is thereby illustrated. Consequently, it would actually be semantically correct for any European school in Latin to refer to Africa, Africans, so-called Negroid peoples, as Indians. A most revealing book published in 1822 actually shows that Europeans, English speakers in particular, recognized and accepted that Africans could be referred to as Indians. So again, you know, this is further evidence that shows that we are who we're supposed to be. All right, yeah, now we're going to get back to a diplomatic correspondence from um, the year 1281, uh, or what we call 1864 over here, in, uh, according to the Christian calendar. Um, they're talking about, basically, it's a letter from the United States, uh, I mean, from, from Tunis, the, from the Tunisian government to the United States, talking about slavery and stuff like that. Okay. Now, um, they're talking about, okay, our government, like all Muslim governments, is a theocracy and its administration is consequently based upon the laws which are in their nature both civil and religious. The Muslim religion tolerates or permits slavery, and this it does because slavery is an institution interior to the three revealed religions, Messiah, Christian, and Mohammedan. In the time of Jacob, the Israel of God, the robber was doomed to suffer slavery for one year as a punishment for his crime. Our religion substituted for the year of bondage, cutting off the hand at the wrist. But it must be remarked that our religion authorized slavery only on such conditions and under such laws as are very strict and difficult to be observed. One of these conditions is never to injure or tyrannize over a slave. Nay, a slave who is ill-treated is declared thereby free. The words of the prophets are, Every slave ill-treated is free, ipso facto. 
there are in in our religious books innumerable precepts enjoining upon masters uh, uh, the exercise of benevolence toward their slaves. And the last uh, last words of our prophet, on whom may the grace of God rest, were these: "I commend you, prayer, and your slaves." He used to say also, the men whom you possess are your brethren. It is God who has subjected them to you. Now he who has one of his brethren under his subjection should let him eat of eat the bread of which he partakes and should clothe him as he clothes himself and should not overwork him. So again, this is, uh, the, 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 this is some of the, um, you know, evidence regarding the the ideology that they had towards slavery at the time because the reason why they're writing this letter to these people is to suggest to let them know that they need to stop the enslavement of of the Moors over here. Now, of course, they, yeah, they ain't use the word more, but understand this is a translation from the Tunisian government and in the English. Okay, um, and then they's like and then and the enslavement of the Negroes who are so different from whites in their instincts and character rendered the observance of these rules still more difficult. In fact, quarrels often occur here between Negroes and their masters, which had no cause other than the natural repugnance and antipathy that exists between the two races, and these quarrels were a source of unhappiness to slaves and of offense to masters, often giving occasion for the latter to violate the laws enacted for the well-being of the former. Slavery becoming worse with time at length attracted the attention of the Tunisian government, which finally advised as a radical remedy for the existing laws to the complete abolition of slavery in the Regency. For when a master could no longer treat his slave with the former course, with, with the kindness prescribed by our laws, the slave had to be either sold or freed from bondage. The former was scarcely a remedy, since the slave could only change masters and the evil was likely to be repeated. The latter course was effectual and final and hence its adoption by our government. The act of emancipation occurred in the month of Muharram 1262 of the Hegira uh, 1845 Christian calendar. During the reign of Ashmed Bey of blessed memory, this, this prince addressed a letter to the religious tribunals on the occasion in which he said, it has been proved to us in a manner beyond question that our people are incapable of holding Negroes as slaves in accordance with the conditions prescribed by our laws. We have therefore deemed it necessary in order to ameliorate the condition of these unfortunate beings to abolish slavery altogether. We have been influenced in adopting this measure by some political considerations. The political considerations here alluded to can be interpreted in different ways, but in my opinion, our lamented sovereign had in mind the principles demonstrated by the great political economists of our age that those countries where free labor exists to the exclusion of that which is servile and forced are thereby rendered more prosperous and happy. One of our distinguished writers and religious dignitaries in a document issued to induce all under his charge to comply with the requisitions of our late sovereign employed the following language. O generous souls, hearts full of compassion, your law is on the side of liberty. Holding men as slaves is a misfortune and a disgrace. But God, who is the author of our being, can change the order of things, making slaves masters and masters slaves. Another of your inquiries relates to the influence of slavery on our institutions and to the sentiments entertained by our people in regard to its abolition. Since the holding of man and slavery was found to be neither necessary to supply the common wants of life nor needful to the well-being of society. Such a practice was and in general abandoned here without pain, if not cheerfully. And now, after nearly 20 years of experience, I am satisfied that this change is not regretted. You know what I'm saying? So again, these folks, they, they knew that, you know, they needed to abolish slavery, man, because they couldn't keep doing what they were doing to us. And like I say, this is 1864. Um, they uh, 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 they they further go to talk about a new, uh, there, there are numerous accounts of the fact that yes we were yes we may have been slaves but we were not 
you know, we were not so removed from society not to the point where we didn't deserve any respect. The only problem is, is that when we did get released, the under the 1863 Union, it was taken, taken. Uh, I'm sorry, the um, the people in here in the Americas took the time to to create this this self defeating image of us and then teach it to us. And now, you know, we suffering on, 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 on this physical plane as a result of something that is purely spiritual, but stimulated by events of the physical. Um, this is, like I say, these are the little things that we need to address regarding citizenship and nationality. Another big issue to uh, kind of bring up here is uh, the fact that, you know, the uh, this is a letter from Tunis, uh, June 17, 1865. Um, he's saying, Sir, I have the honor to report a state of general tranquility and good order in the streets. Uh, domestic, the domestic difficulties which were so serious last year seem to be fully overcome. And though the cause of jealousy and misunderstanding between several European governments that have a special interest here are not removed, there are fewer indications of irritation and bitterness now than usual. Okay, and now, uh, the, basically, it's, a, it's about the Bay of Morocco. And uh, one of the things that they talk about is the fact that the Bay is, I believe, sincerely interested for the abolition and for the establishment of peace in America, but in his expressions of interest, he evidently avoids any expression that might prove distasteful to his neighbors. Very respectably, your obedient servant, Honorable William Hunter, acting as the Secretary of State in you know, Washington, D.C. Yeah, it, it's just, um, the, the, it, again, it just goes to show you that, you know, a lot of nations were on our side with respect to wanting to see us as free. It's just that the means that by how we got free or the laws that made us free, supposedly, they weren't exactly in our best interest in a legally, they were written in a legalese fashion that did not allow us to fully enjoy, that doesn't allow us to fully enjoy the bands of freedom. Because again, it deals with us not having a nationality or them not wanting to recognize our nationality. So, um, now, you, uh, the other, the other issue to be really, really to be looked at, again, is the fact that, um, okay, um, we got a letter, th this next letter is, uh, from Morocco to the United States government, letting them know that they will not receive the Confederate States in any of their ports. Okay, now, uh, this one is an 1863, or the year 1280. Um, we continue to make inquiries regarding your welfare and praying God that you are well. When you had addressed to us regarding the vessels of, of the insurgent so-called Confederate States demanding not to uh, receive them into the ports of our master, protected by God but subject to seizure, we had answered to you with that then appeared to us relative to the subject, that you have repeated your writing on the matter and explained by length the subject stating at the same time that your demand was one of a right and in accordance with the treaty stipulations between the two governments. And so far you have explained the subject of in your said letter. I have now to inform you that we have forwarded your note accompanied by our writing on the subject to His Majesty, our Master, and I have received the answer ordering me to act with you on this matter in accordance with the treaties which no, no one of the nations nor others can separate from. Therefore, we are ready to, ready to, we are ready to that, and I have this day ordered the officers of our master, the Sultan, in the ports, not to receive any one of the insurgents, so-called Confederate states, for the reason that they are not known to us, nor is there any consul who may make, 
them known to us, therefore they shall not be admitted and to act with your vice councils in our ports in accordance with the treaties and in, and in conformity with the royal order of the majesty our master the sultan and peace again so the question you would have to ask yourself why would these people be writing this letter you know to to the sultan of morocco you know this is a, a scan copy now why would they do that and the only thing you can sit here and, and say is that again we are in the dominions of the Moorish Empire still into this day. That is the issue here. They are still operating through the permission of the Muslim states, the North African states, namely Morocco. Um, they were doing it then. They needed the permission of the Moroccans to actually, of the Sultan, to actually go to war with the Confederate states. They'll need the permission again if they're going to go to war over here, trust me. Um, or attempt to have some sort of war. Um, the uh, this is another letter that um, deals with why uh, we declare ourselves as Moors as well, or as subjects of the Moorish Empire, whichever you want to prove it. Um, now, this is uh, basically the Sultan is like he's not letting go of his of, the, of his. Um, his authority over his more subjects, despite the fact that they ain't even they're, they're not within uh, the kingdom, the immediate kingdom itself. So uh, basically, you are aware of. Oh, I'm sorry. This was a. Uh, this was written in 1297, and I guess um, uh, 1880, and this reads: To our praise, praise be to the only God, to our prudent friend, the respectable and wise gentleman. Mr. Felix A. Matthews, representative of the American nation, and etc. You are aware that we have already manifested to you and all other foreign representatives verbally with regard to the prejudice which our nation suffers by the naturalization of our subjects who consider themselves outside of our jurisdiction and exempt from contributions to our government. And we have received letters from His Sharifian Majesty that this is against the laws of this happy empire. All these people who leave this country and return are under the laws of this country. And now, since this prejudice still exists and these people are still protected, we ordained we are ordained by His Sharifian Majesty to renew our demand wherein he has his rights and the following are the text and words of His Majesty's letter. Conforming our, confirming our former letter relative to the naturalization to be communicated to the foreign representatives at Tangiers that the laws of our happy empire do not permit that our subjects, either Moors or Jews, should change their nationality for another, and that notwithstanding this, that prejudice still exists, now we are going to write to our governors not to recognize all of this, as the rule of our country is not to, uh, as not to recognize either passports or certificates of naturalization, and we ordain you to renew this matter before the foreign representatives before we address ourselves to our to our nations I mean uh, to our governors and explain to them that I that our desire is to be in good relations with all the nations still we cannot admit a thing which is against our regulations and to the prejudice and detriment of our rights we beg you to bring this to the knowledge of the powers that you represent of whose friendship we are sure so that they may not permit a detriment to our laws and you are aware that the subjects of Turkey are not allowed the right to withdrawing themselves from the jurisdiction and laws of their country. Peace and friendship. See, this is about the fact that a letter that was written between the Turkish written about the Turkish regarding the citizenship in Turkey and they was trying to basically say that, you know, if 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 basically the Turks just ain't gonna break one of their own laws just for the sake of, you know, um you know, uh, some country that they're in a treaty with, especially if that treaty goes against the Quranic law that they exist upon. Because again, that's that ecclesiastical law. So, you know, how can somebody give up rights that they ordain through God? You can't. Which is again, why the Constitution even further supports the fact that you can't waive rights that are granted through God. 